For many of us, it's our worst fear to lose a loved one at the hands of another and never receive answers or justice. But unfortunately, there are hundreds of cases just like this across the globe, from unidentified does with nobody to miss them to the gruesome murder of children. These are just three horrific historic mysteries that will leave you with more questions than answers. Carrie Selvage. Carrie Selvage was a 43-year-old schoolteacher from Indiana in March of 1900 when she was admitted to the Indianapolis Union State Hospital after suffering a nervous breakdown. Her family were prominent figures in the area and she lived a comfortable life. After she was admitted to the hospital, she was given a spacious room on the ground floor of the two-story building, which came with an excellent view of the hospital grounds. On March 11th, a nurse entered Carrie's room to check on her. The 43-year-old was standing by the window, taking in the view. She asked the nurse for a glass of milk, and the nurse obliged, stepping out of the room and locking it behind her to fetch the milk. She returned no more than five minutes later, but was shocked to discover that Carrie was gone, seemingly escaping a locked room and vanishing into thin air. An extensive search of the property and the surrounding area was carried out by hospital staff members. Carrie had been wearing only felt slippers and a long blue nightdress when she was last seen. However, despite the efforts of the Institute's staff, there was no trace of the missing schoolteacher. Later that day, Carrie's brother, Joseph, came to visit his sibling. It was then that he and the rest of the family were made aware of her disappearance. In cooperation with law enforcement and aided by local volunteers, the family set out on their own search for the 43-year-old, spending days exploring the nearby area. Even small spaces on the hospital grounds were checked, as well as fields, lakes, and creeks. But still, they found nothing. Carrie's family offered a generous reward for information that would help them bring her home, but it went unclaimed. A few witnesses alleged to have seen her boarding a train bound for Ohio, where the 43-year-old was born, but these were soon proven to be false sightings. After the search, the case lay dormant. It wasn't until 1902 that a break came when a medical student noticed a cadaver that, chillingly, bore a striking resemblance to the missing schoolteacher. The student, along with his peers, had been viewing a lecture on the dissection of a corpse when he'd noticed the similarities. He informed his teacher, who agreed with the notion that this may be Carrie Selvage. The professor sent for Carrie's dentist, who noted that the body had a gold-filled tooth in the same location that Carrie had one. This seemed like a good confirmation for the teacher, who then called for Carrie's brother, Joseph. Joseph admitted that he couldn't be sure the body was his sister's. He wanted further proof. Once law enforcement became involved, School staff were questioned about how the remains had come to be in their possession. They responded that they had purchased the corpse from a local man named Rufus Cantrell, who was subsequently arrested. Rufus, an infamous grave robber from Indiana, who was dubbed the King of the Ghouls, reportedly spoke freely with investigators. He supplied the names of others working in his trade and explained the ins and outs of stealing and selling a body. He even mentioned the names of several surgeons who'd paid him extra for fresh corpses. According to the police, Cantrell confessed to kidnapping a woman on the night of March 11th, 1900. He stated that he and his men were stealing from a local cemetery when they noticed a woman sneaking around the grounds of the hospital nearby. They were afraid she would give them away, so they snatched her, took her to the basement of an old, disused farmhouse, and abused her for several days. Cantrell then sold her body to a medical school. Cantrell later denied having confessed to the police, claiming that law enforcement, the media, or both had made up the story that he supposedly told. After Cantrell's alleged confession, investigators closed the case. Carrie was laid to rest alongside long-deceased family members. The hospital that she'd disappeared from soon closed down. It was, at one point, turned into a boarding house, 
but this too shut its doors not long after opening. The surprise twist in the case came another two decades later, in 1920, when the property was purchased by a local company that planned to convert it. Construction work began quickly after it was bought, with the crew beginning to remove pieces of the building, including a section of the attic. After an iron worker was given the job of removing the cupola above the attic, he decided to enlarge the entrance to the small space, after which he peered in and came face to face with a skeleton. The remains were in a seated position, with a blue nightdress and felt slippers lying nearby. Investigators arrived on the scene with Carrie Selvage's family. They identified her clothing and believed that the body was hers. No cause of death could be determined, but law enforcement did not believe that the 43-year-old had been met with violence. Noting that her skull had fallen to the floor, while the upper bones of her body had been leaning against the wall. They theorized that Carrie had starved to death or frozen to death. Carrie's family, however, were not satisfied with either of these answers. Joseph, in particular, stated his belief that a hospital worker had taken his sister's life and stashed her body in the attic. He came to this conclusion after noting that Carrie was partially blind and suffered from severe arthritis, so he couldn't understand how she would have been able to climb into this space by herself. Newspapers at the time described the space like so. The building is of unusual construction, which accounts for the length of time the body lay in the attic without being discovered. The place where the skeleton was found is apparently a second attic, reached by going through a door to the left of that of the main attic, climbing over an inside roof and down to the right into the small corner where the skeleton was found. Still, after Carrie's body was found, for real this time, she was laid to rest. Many questions surround her death, and the body of Jane Doe, who was initially thought to be Carrie, has never been identified. Her remains were exhumed and handed over to the police after Carrie's body was found in the hospital. Eugene Butler's Victims Eugene Butler was born sometime in 1849 to Ephraim and Rebecca Butler. Raised in Buffalo, New York, Butler lived a life of luxury thanks to his parents' massive wealth. In 1882, aged around 33, Butler moved to North Dakota and purchased a 480-acre farm in Niagara. Here, he was generally seen as a recluse. He never married or had children, avoided contact with his neighbors, and was only known to leave his house when he journeyed to the city of Larimore for business, although it's unclear what his line of business was. During his time away from the farm, he would hire workers to run it for him. It wasn't long before Butler started exhibiting odd behaviors and signs of mental illness, however. He began suffering from hallucinations and complained that invisible individuals were chasing him. And in 1906, things took a turn for the worse, when Butler started riding out into the night, screaming and scaring his neighbors and other locals who were living nearby. He was, as a result, considered a public nuisance and was admitted to the North Dakota State Hospital. During his time in the hospital, he frequently expressed his fear about the invisible people who were chasing him, and also stated that he was afraid of having his photo taken, believing that the camera would suck out his soul. He was rarely considered a problem and was not known to be violent. He showed no tendencies toward homicidal behavior. In fact, he was considered to be gallant and fond of attending hospital dances and even developing a crush on one of the female doctors. He died on October 22, 1913, aged around 64. His remains were sent to Middleport, New York, where he was buried by his relatives. After Butler's death, his estate was divided between his living relatives and renovations were started on the property. While digging beneath the house, however, workers discovered something bizarre. Six sets of skeletal remains. They had been dumped in a hole dug from outside of the house beneath its foundation. They were later determined to all belong to teenage boys and young men, and their skulls had been crushed. At least two of his victims had broken legs. It was suggested in newspapers at the time that this was done to fit the body into the dump site. The murder weapon was determined to be a sharp instrument, which left a clearly defined hole in the left side of each skull, and the victims were believed to have been killed between 1903 and 1906. Before it was established that the remains belonged to young men, it was rumored that Butler was responsible for the slaying of an entire family. 
but police noted that no families were missing from the area. Other details soon emerged about the victims. One of them was aged between 15 and 18, and another had a crooked nose. Investigators were unable to establish their identities, but suspected that all the victims were homeless individuals who'd been hired by Butler to help work on his farm during the summer when he went away on business. This would explain why nobody had reported them missing or noticed that Butler's farmhands had vanished. Detectives also theorized that the victims were killed because their employer believed they were stealing from him, as he reportedly had a lot of cash lying around his house, and he was known to be paranoid and delusional. Furthermore, no personal belongings or clothing were found with the bodies. It is believed that the victims were buried nude, and their clothing was burned by Butler after their deaths. After word leaked about the murders, curious locals and onlookers visited the farm with the intention of looking at the crime scene. It was later discovered that some of the bones had gone missing from the remains, suggesting that visitors had stolen them. In the 108 years since the bodies were discovered, none have been identified. One possible lead emerged shortly after the remains were found, when Leo Urbanski, a wealthy farmer residing in Minnesota, claimed that his brother, John, who sometimes used the surname Miller, may have been one of the victims. He had gone missing near Niagara in 1902, and before he vanished, had written to his brother to inform him that he was working for a bachelor in the city. The letter's postmark indicated that it had been mailed from Larimore, the town where Butler conducted business. However, it is unconfirmed whether or not one of Butler's victims was John Urbanski. The most recent effort to identify the victims was in 2016, when the Grand Forks County Sheriff's Department reached out to the public in an effort to find new leads. The department also requested that anyone with stolen bones from the scene return them, as they could help solve the case. By 2016, old case records were either destroyed or lost. No progress appears to have been made at this time. Jean Van Kalk Jean Van Kalk was born in Brussels, Belgium on September 17th, 1887. In 1906, she was living with her grandparents, but every evening she would spend an hour or two with her mother while accompanied by her grandfather. It's unclear why Jean wasn't living with her mother, but her father was absent from her life. He was a typographer working with the newspaper and had abandoned the family at some point before his daughter's birth. At 6.30 in the evening of February 7th, 1906, Jean, aged eight, left her grandparents' home as she normally did. This time, however, for the first time, she was allowed to visit her mother alone because her grandfather was working. However, Jean never arrived at her mother's home on the corner of Boudoin Boulevard. At around 11.45 that night, Joseph Ehlenbosch, a machinist with no connection to the eight-year-old, noticed a package outside the door of a local home, a house that was later demolished in 1965. Finding the parcel highly suspicious, Joseph alerted the authorities, who sent out a lone policeman to inspect it. He took the package back to the station, and the officers eventually opened it at the orders of the department's chief. Inside was a blue pea coat and a checkered dress. Looking closer, they noticed blood. Then the item in the parcel fell to the ground, and the officers realized it was the body of a little girl. She had been dismembered, wrapped in thick paper, and tied with a hemp cord. Her body was still warm. Her legs had been removed and were missing from the parcel. The press and the public prosecutor were immediately informed, as was the police commissioner. Not long after the police had unwrapped the body, Jean was reported missing. Investigators made the connection between the clothing on the body and the clothing the eight-year-old was last seen. Upon hearing of Jean's death, her mother fainted. The coroner who examined Jean's body reported that the gruesome crime had been carried out by someone with specialist knowledge, likely a doctor or a butcher. Her cause of death was established as suffocation from violent vomiting after she was forced to consume a large quantity of alcohol. Most sources reported that she was violently abused, with one specifying that she was sexually assaulted before death. It was determined that her time of death was between 8 and 9 p.m. Shortly after Jean's burial, law enforcement began searching for the perpetrator. They dredged canals to find her missing legs, but they weren't found until February 16th, nine days after her murder. 
A gardener found two packages about 40 centimeters in length in the former royal park of Steifenberg, which contained the little girl's legs. They had been wrapped in pages of the newspaper, dated January 12th and January 27th, 1906. It was the same paper her father worked for. Pages from the journal de Paris had also been used. Jean's boots had been found in the area one day earlier. Following this discovery, the Belgian government offered a reward of 20,000 Belgian francs to anyone who could identify the little girl's killer, and even offered leniency with regard to any person indirectly involved who incriminated themselves. During the investigation, a police dog was dispatched to the crime scene. It stopped at the home where the package containing Jean's body was found, and then at another house. The canine then barked at length outside the home belonging to the little girl's grandparents. Two men were eventually taken into custody, as was a butcher's apprentice named Jean Many, but they were all released without charge. A bloody shirt was discovered some time afterwards, although it was never confirmed to be connected to the case. One person of interest was named Dr. Nysons, but again, no concrete link was found. Jean's case was highly publicized and generated a lot of fear around missing children, as well as a lot of outrage as the police failed to solve the mystery. Newspapers at the time criticized investigators' incompetence, and in 1909, a Parisian lawyer published his findings after he gained access to the police files and noted 29 failures in the investigation. Some leads were not followed up on because they came from a young girl who was a friend of Jean. The girl reported seeing her friend at around 7 p.m. on the night she went missing, near her grandparents' house, in the company of a man she seemed to know and trust, but heading in the opposite direction from her mother's home. One year after Jean's death, another little girl, Annette Bello, who was six at the time, disappeared while she was outside playing with her brother in December of 1907. A man between the ages of 35 and 40 had approached the children, asking Annette's brother to go and buy him cigarettes. He said he would repay him with sweets, and that he would watch his sister while he was gone. Annette's body was discovered the following day behind a veterinary school. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled. Both Annette's and Jean's cases are still unsolved. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.